Good, 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 good. Wow, what a morning. Love it. What God does is so much more important than what we program. I think I'm, I said something like that in a preach recently. I said, God is, you know, let's let God do what he does and let's not worry about the program. And he seems to be taking me up on it, so that's good. Um, long may I continue. Yes. Lord, yeah, have your way. Do what you want to do. You already are. Keep speaking. Speak through your word as well. We ask that you would minister to us whatever you want to do. In Jesus' name. Please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. Last week, we began an expositional series, working our way through the book of Hebrews, passage by passage. And I admitted that one aspect of expositional preaching that is both a strength and is stretching is that it forces me to preach on whatever topic the text brings up, rather than just looking at my favourite subjects. This morning, in only my second week of the series, we are encountering a great example of that. <laughs> I am going to be talking on a topic today that I have never preached on before, and I'm not sure when I would have ever preached on it otherwise. Now, as I also mentioned last week, the main topic of Hebrews, rightly, is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that will continue to be the same as we open God's Word today. But, as we read this next little section of Scripture, see if there's a word that keeps on appearing. Hebrews 1, 4-7, and I'll read the start of verse 8 just to round off the sentence. So he, Jesus, became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says he makes his angels, spirits, his servants, flames of fire. But about the son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And on it goes. Today's topic is Jesus and the angels. Um, this week, more than last week, it's going to be a bit about theology. Uh, to start with, I wasn't really sure how we were going to get some application out of this. Because um, it's an odd topic. But then Elise was talking with me and she just reminded me that God's word is living. God's word does what it does. Yes. And we are praying, I believe that God has told me to start working through Hebrews. So we're trusting that what he has for you today will come through in his word. Um, there will be application of some sort as we go on as well, but this is about looking into his word, finding the truth in his word, and letting that truth minister to us. And this is a topic that will continue to some degree, at least into my next preach, because this focus on angels doesn't really fade until chapter 2, verse 17, and then it re-emerges later in Hebrews as well. So if I don't cover an aspect of angels that you're like, oh, you didn't cover that, I'll probably get to it in a week or two. Um, David Jeremiah, in his aptly titled book, Angels, <laughs> which I have been reading quite a bit this week while prepping the sermon, points out that this passage is the most extensive treatment on angels anywhere in Scripture. Nowhere else does it focus on angels for as long as this. So if we're ever going to talk about angels, this is the right place to do it. <laughs> However, as David Jeremiah also points out, although this is the most extensive treatment of angels in the Bible, the focus of the passage remains more about angels. Jesus, and that scripturally is the right focus, and that will remain my focus today. But let's start up with some angel stories. Everybody loves an angel story. So, one angel story. There was this um, missionary group of people, and they were in this little community area. I think they had their own little missionary village. They were trying to reach out to the tribes that were surrounding them, and they heard that the tribes were going to come against them and attack them. All right, so they're, they're freaking out. They're thinking, what do we do? We better pray. We better just prepare and, and you know, just wait to see what happens. And they knew that the, angel, the, the, the guys were supposed to be attacking them overnight. So they were waiting there and they were praying. And they're saying, Lord, you know, have your way, have your way. And the attack never came. And in the morning, they still hadn't been attacked. And they were sure it was supposed to be an attack. But the people from the surrounding areas came and ended up talking with them. 
and said, well, who, who were all those guards that were guarding you? Who were all those big men that were standing there ready to fight with their swords drawn? And they realized that God had been looking after them with some angels. So that's one. Second story, when I was younger, my mum was taking us somewhere and the only vehicle we had left was Dad's work uh, van. And Dad's work van had a ladder on the roof. And it was going to be my mum and my brother and I all travelling in this work van somewhere. And we looked up at the ladder on the roof and we thought, we're not sure if this is attached properly. Um, but we didn't really know how to attach it properly. It was sitting there. And we thought, okay, cool. Lord, you look after that. Lord, we'll pray that your angels will hold that onto the, onto the vehicle. And we started driving away. And as we're driving down the road, there was clonking noises on the roof, which was really concerning. But we kind of ignored them, and we just were praying, God, hold the ladder in place, and the clonking noises continued. And then after a while, the clonking noises stopped. And we thought, well, we'd better stop and check to see if uh, something has changed. So we got out, and... I think we got out on the same side of the vehicle. I'll get a little bit sketchy on this, but we got out and we looked up on the roof and the ladder was gone. It, <laughs> it wasn't on the roof anymore. And for a moment we thought, well, that's not good. Um, the, the prayer didn't work. Um, the ladder has gone somewhere. We'll have to go back and look for it. And then we walked around to the other side of the vehicle and the ladder was on the side of the vehicle. <laughs> There was one bolt sticking out from the roof rack, and that one bolt had caught the ladder as it was falling off, and had held the ladder along the side of the vehicle for however long it had been going for. And that prevented the ladder from falling off the roof. That is a very strong bolt. Very interesting that we've been praying, Lord, let your angels hold it onto the vehicle. And that was, the, that was what we saw. Just wanted to throw those out there as we start looking at angels. I also want to throw out one other verse that isn't in today's preach. It's a bit later on. Um, in Hebrews 2, verses, verse 14. And not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. And I really get the sense that this morning we've had a bit of ministry. I really get the sense that God's been doing what he wanted to do. He's taken the service. He's shaped it the way he wants to. I find it fascinating that, again, the morning that I'm speaking about angels, this is what we're getting. Mm. So thank you, God, for that. Mm. But opening up to the scripture, opening up to this particular passage, the first point that we pull out of it is, Jesus is superior to the angels. Mm. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Verse 4. Now, angels are fascinating to a lot of people. They're spiritual beings. They seem to have a lot of power compared to us. And they're very popular among people who consider themselves spiritual, whether or not they actually believe in Jesus or the Holy Spirit or even God. Apparently, Time magazine, referring to the rise of angel mania, stated, Angels are the handy compromise. All fluff and meringue, kind, non-judgmental. They're available to everyone, like aspirin. Yet, as verse 7 of our passage says, and as we will see repeated throughout Scripture, angels are the servants of God. To consider them some mystical being whom we should seek to interact with apart from in reference to God is something that's not supported by Scripture. Angels are there to serve God first and believers second, and that's it. But beware the angel that speaks on its own topic without reference to God, that seeks worship for itself, or that states something that does not line up with Scripture. Galatians 1 verse 8 says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Angels can lie. Although, if they do so, it shows they're fallen angels no longer serving God, or are even potentially Satan himself, whom 2 Corinthians 11.14 says can masquerade as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. We need to be careful, even when an angel speaks, to take it back to scripture. If we don't, we can fall into deception. 
Two prominent examples of this in history can be seen in the angel that spoke to Muhammad, the founder of Islam, and the angel that spoke to Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism. In both cases, another gospel was given. And in both cases, new religions have been formed that deny something of the character of Jesus and lead people astray. If we can be lied to by angels, or even deceived without knowing about it, we should also be careful with any human teachers we come across. No matter how good your human teacher is, take it back to Scripture. Check with Scripture as well. So, non-fallen angels serve God. But what does verse 4 mean when it says that Jesus became superior to the angels? Or verse 9 mean when it says that God set him above his companions? Was he ever not superior to them? Well, yes. In Philippians 2, we are presented with a very early statement of faith about Jesus, which begins in verses 6 to 8 by stating that Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. As we saw last week, Jesus is a part of the eternal trinity, there with both God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in the beginning of creation shaping and upholding everything as the word of God. Yet, in order to restore our relationship with God the Father, following the sinful choices of humanity, we see that Jesus was willing to give up his equality with God for a season. That season became the 33-ish years that Jesus lived as a human being on earth. 33 years when he was lower than the angels, limited to the reach of his human arms and the understanding of his human mind, when for all of eternity he had been omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. I don't think we'll ever be able to comprehend exactly what it meant for Jesus to give up everything and limit himself in the way he did. And then to face death, the final enemy, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 26, Something that was not God's intent for humanity to ever face, let alone Jesus. And to be separated from God the Father, Mark 15, 34. Something that had never happened in all of eternity. He did all of this for us. Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. The works of the Son, the things we looked at last week, have resulted in Jesus being exalted above the angels and have also led to our second point. Jesus has inherited a name superior to the angels. What name? Well... Firstly, you could probably say the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus, or Yeshua, which we translate as Joshua, means God saves, or God delivers us. Christ, or Messiah, means the Anointed One, and was the title for Israel's promised deliverer, and the title given to Jesus because of his mighty acts. As we spoke about last week, there were various competing ideas about what the Messiah would be like, and Jesus fulfilled them all, coming as the warrior king, the perfect priest, and the suffering servant rolled into one, an anointed deliverer, truly God. Now, an interesting aside here, when we're looking at for Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, or seeking to see Jesus in the Old Testament, One fascinating example is found in a very old book, The Church History by Eusebius. He points out, follow along here, the very names Jesus and Christ were honoured even by the God-loving prophets of old. When describing God's high priest as a man of supreme power, Moses calls him and his office Christ, anointed. 
as a mark of honour and glory, understanding the divine character of Christ. He was also inspired by the Holy Spirit to foresee quite clearly the title Jesus. Although previously it had never been known, Moses gave the title Jesus, again as a type or symbol, only to the man he knew would succeed him after his death. His successor had been known by another name, Hoshea, which his parents had given him, but Moses calls him Jesus, Joshua, the son of Nun. In this way, Moses bestows the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, as a supreme honour on the two men who in his time surpassed all others in merit and glory, the high priest and the man who would rule after him, Joshua and the anointed one, the priest, the two most important men in the generation after Moses, called Jesus and Christ. Wow. <laughs> but this is not the only name that Jesus receives which is superior to that of the angels. When we look at Hebrews 1 verse 5, we read, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Jesus is given the title, Son of God. John Piper says of this passage, He has always been the Son of God, just like he has always been heir of all things. But when he had made purification for sins and triumphed over death and Satan, Christ was declared Son of God and heir of all things on a new basis and in a new way. Now he reigns as the Son of God, not only by his eternal right, but now by the right of his victory over sin and death. He is Son of God in manifest power by the resurrection. God never said such a thing to any angel. No angel sits at God's right hand as the Son of God in power. No angel is given the title Son. They are all servants of God only. And no angel sits at God's right hand. In fact, to take this even further, no angel is mentioned sitting in God's presence at all. We see them standing in his presence, ready to serve, and we see them falling on their faces before God in worship, as in Revelation 7-11. Never seated in authority, never reigning with Christ. We, on the other hand, will. But I'll return to that later passage. Third thing we see in this passage, Jesus is the firstborn of God. In focusing on the superiority of Jesus, we move away from our angel focus slightly here, but it's a point worth addressing nonetheless. In John 3.16, we see Jesus referred to as the one and only Son, or the only begotten Son of God. In Colossians 1.15-20, we see Jesus being called the firstborn twice. Once in verse 15, when he's called firstborn over all creation, and once in verse 18, when he is called the firstborn from among the dead. When Jesus is called firstborn, could refer to any one of these three elements, or a combination of them. So let's briefly look at each of them. Only begotten Son. In this very important way, Jesus is the Son of God as no other being can be. In that way is that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit as a human embryo within a human womb. Matthew 20, 1 verse 20. Growing in this way, Jesus is fully the Son of God. Fully God and fully human. This divine conception has never been repeated in human history and never will be, despite what Greek mythology might tell you. God has a Son and his name is Jesus. Born of God and God himself, the word who was with God and the word who is God. John 1 verse 1. Second, firstborn over creation. In the Bible, the term firstborn carries with it the sense of being the most prized or significant or preeminent part of the family. The son with the greatest inheritance and the greatest responsibility. This is the main way in which Jesus is first born over creation. However, the Colossians passage also reminds us that he is first born, also in the sense that he was before all things, 
117, and created all things, 116. Jesus is not a created being himself. Becoming a human was not the beginning of his existence. Rather, we see him existing before anything else as an aspect of God the Trinity. He is not first born in terms of being created, but he is first born in terms of authority and in terms of pre-existence. And that includes authority and pre-existence over the angels. As humans, we too share some of this authority, but Christ's position as firstborn shows his preeminence over any other one of God's heirs. And then firstborn from among the dead. This is the most exciting way in which Jesus is firstborn, because it's also a promise for us. Romans 8.29 tells us that God has predestined for Jesus to be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 calls Jesus' resurrection the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which is a New Testament term for death. When we accept the work of Christ on our behalf, accept him as Lord and Saviour, and lay our lives before him in confession, repentance, and baptism, we are raised to life spiritually with him. We have passed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and we are promised life with him eternally. These three ways in which Jesus is first born are all worthy of praise. And that leads nicely into the next thing we see in this passage. The angels worship Jesus. We don't worship the angels. One of the real issues with the obsession over angels in pop culture is that they become objects of our focus, and sometimes our awe. It's easy enough to realise why. Picture the great company of angels suddenly appearing to the shepherds in Luke 2 verse 13, or the fiery horses and chariots filling the hills in 2 Kings 6.17. There's a reason why angels often have to tell people, do not be afraid. But when that awe and terror crosses the line into adoration and worship, we are falling into the sin of idolatry, something that would horrify an angel of God. We see this happen a few times in Revelation when John is confronted by an angel and, obviously awed, bows down to worship it. In those moments, the angel responds, as in Revelation 22 verse 9, Don't do that! I'm a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God! Angels are messengers from God, not gods themselves. They, like us, are created beings created by God to serve him. An angel offered worship will reject it, unless they're a fallen angel or Satan himself. We see Satan trying to claim worship from Jesus, no less, when he offers Jesus the kingdoms of the world in Matthew 4, 9-10. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, just to clarify a few difficult scriptures, there are places in the Old Testament that seem on the surface to go against this principle, such as Joshua 5.14, where Joshua falls at the feet of the commander of the Lord's armies and worships him without rebuke. But there are two ways of interpreting moments like this that can make sense of the situation. One way is through realising that sometimes in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord can be an appearance of God himself. Now this appears to be what Genesis 18, 1 and 2 means when it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. Three men are mentioned one of whom Abraham apparently recognises as God, Abraham goes over to them, bows to God, and begins his conversation with them. No rejection of worship is needed, because God is the one receiving the worship. This, by the way, is how I personally interpret a lot of these Old Testament appearances. You can even argue that these theophanies, or God-in-the-flesh moments, could be a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. 
I really like that interpretation for Daniel 3.25, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the furnace and are seen walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, with a fourth man who looks like a son of the gods or like the son of God. And we don't see any worship given in that passage, so it could be an angel, but I quite like the Jesus interpretation. The other way you can interpret these passages is by carefully looking at the wording involved. Returning to Joshua 5.14, we are told that Joshua bows at the feet of this figure in worship in some translations, but in reverence in other translations. The word in the Hebrew is hawa, don't know how to say it exactly, which implies worship, but more literally means to bow down low or prostrate oneself, which could also imply merely paying honour rather than worship. It's a fairly fine distinction, however, which is one reason I prefer the theophany interpretation for most passages. David Jeremiah, commenting on this tendency of people to adore angels, reminds us that our main focus shouldn't be on the messenger, but on the message itself. Suppose you received a letter today from a favourite friend who's far away. What would you do with it first? Would you stare at the stationery for hours to analyse and admire it? Would you obtain a chemical analysis of the ink to learn exactly what it's made of? Would you investigate where the paper came from and how it was woven and cut? No. Paper and ink are simply the means of your friend's communication. What you're interested in is your friend and your friend's message. The same logic applies to our approach to angels. Angels are just a means of communication from the God who communicates. What's important is the message angels bring, not the messengers themselves. There is a saying, don't shoot the messenger. It's also remember not to worship the messenger. The fifth point in this section, angels are wind and fire. In the NIV, Verse 7 says, he makes his angels spirits. But in the NIV 1984, it says winds, which I prefer. And a lot of other translations also use. The author of Hebrews is quoting Psalm 104, verse 4 here, which does talk about winds. And in fact, according to H.D. Andrews, in the Hebrew, there is no reference to angels. The psalmist is referring to the forces of nature which God uses as his agents. The Septuagint, however, modified the translation of the Hebrew, and the writer of the epistle adopted its renderings. I feel like I'm giving you a lot of biblical interpretation lessons today, but very briefly, the Septuagint was the main Greek translation of the Old Testament available in New Testament times, and whenever there's a change between the New Testament quote of an Old Testament passage and the original, It's because the Septuagint translated the word a little differently, such as here. However, this is not something that should concern us as believers, and that's the reason I bring it up. The Hebrew word for wind can also be translated as spirit, just as the Hebrew for messenger, found in the Psalms, can also be translated as angel, found here in Hebrews. There isn't actually a contradiction here, just an alternative understanding. As I said at the beginning of last week, we believe all scripture is God-breathed, and that despite some differences in translation, assuming they're authentic translations and not someone's deliberate distortion, God will allow his word to shine through. Remember, there are layers and layers to scripture. But if we read this passage as saying that angels are flame and wind, what does this teach us? Firstly, I think it helps us see something of the nature of angels. I might get into this more in a future week, but angels are most certainly not flesh and blood, even though at times they can appear in human form. They are spiritual beings without a physical body, and as such can act in ways that seem unbelievable to us physically bound humans. And secondly, the nature of angels as flame and wind, similar in fact to the way we experience the Holy Spirit of God, contrast nicely to the nature of Jesus, who took on a human form in all its fullness. Back to David Jeremiah one more time. It was in that human body that he suffered when he was tempted. And it was in that body that he would taste death. As spirits, angels cannot bleed or die. 
Christ could and did for you and for me. And for you and for me, it's that distinction between Christ and angels that makes an eternity of difference. For by it, Christ was able to destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Angels may be fascinating creatures, but they cannot save us. In their fullest potential, they can only point us to the work of Christ and minister to us on Christ's behalf. Which, when you think about it, is what we are called to do as well. My first draft of this preach was very different. I was intending to go over the entire section on angels in one go, which would have either been a very long preach or would have skimmed a lot of bits. And I was also, as I said at the start, struggling to find the application for us. All I could see to begin with as application was the idea that we shouldn't worship angels and that we should check what angels say to us against scripture. And although both of those things are true and would be helpful if we're ever in that situation, the truth is many of us may never see an angel, or at least we may never realize we have seen an angel. As Hebrews 13 verse 2 says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Angels are probably a lot more common than we realize, and simply not seeing them is not evidence that they are not here. But, believing that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful, I was feeling a bit frustrated about my lack of application. And then, when I was walking with Elise yesterday, God gave me one more insight which really unlocked the passage for me. Angels are the servants of God. We are called to be the servants of God. We can learn from the example of angels, of how they serve God. <laughs> when we look at angels apart from God, they seem incredible. Fire and wind, able to appear and disappear, holy, radiant, able to perform mighty acts, even to bring great works or destruction on the earth. But the correct way to view angels is not apart from God. It is as his servants. No matter how incredible an angel may appear, it is a created being. It submits itself wholly to the will and the service of God. And we know they have a choice in doing this because there are also fallen angels that have chosen not to, in the same way that some people choose not to. Knowing God fully as we don't, dwelling in his very presence, seeing him face to face throughout eternity, the response of these servants of God, these magnificent, powerful beings, is to worship his name, to bow before him, to praise him for all eternity, and to serve him with everything they are. And so greatly do they serve God that even when he was on earth living his life lower than the angels, they still served him with everything they had. In Matthew 26, 53, Jesus said he could ask God the Father for 12 legions of angels if he had need of them. How much more should we serve God with everything we have? We who have not only been made by God also, but we've also been redeemed by God. Something the angels have no need of. We who are made lower than the angels, but with Christ will one day rule over them. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3. The challenge for today is let us not fix our gaze onto angels as worthy of our praise, but let's praise the God who made the angels, the one the angels themselves worship as holy and worthy, the heir of all things. Let us not glorify ourselves and think that we are achieving anything, but let's turn our gaze to the one who gives us the ability to serve him. The firstborn from the dead, the heir of all things, the only begotten Son of God. Let's worship with our fellow servants of God, now and forevermore. Mm -hmm. Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, even in passages that seem a little abstract at times, Lord, I thank you that you speak, that you minister, that you have these words here for a reason. And Lord, I thank you that we can learn from the example of the angels and that we too can trust you and serve you wholeheartedly. Lord, I pray that you will minister to us. 
I thank you that you ministered to us before the serve, before the word this morning, that you were already doing what you want to do. Yeah. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to do that, that you would unlock every truth that we need to hang on to, and you would help us to accurately walk in submission to you. Thank you, Lord, that we are called your sons and daughters. We are not just your servants like the angels, but we can serve you. And we thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm.